Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Are You Ready with Joanne Molinaro, where we talk about how to get ready to live a more purposeful and empowered life. Last week, we talked with Dylan LeMay, the ice cream TikTok and YouTube star who reaches into the hearts and minds of 15 million people, but rarely shows his face. If you haven't already, make sure to download that chat because as you'll quickly discover, Dylan is far more than meets the eye. We ended our chat with Dylan talking about courage, the courage to throw a ball of ice cream, the courage to start a TikTok account, the courage to open your own ice cream shop. But in the end, Dylan alludes to what might be the most difficult challenge of all, finding the courage to reveal his face and not necessarily to the cameras. So this week, as we debrief from last week's episode, I thought we could talk about vulnerability, just how hard it can be to shed the guise of reliability or solidity, the I have my shit together veneer, to expose something a little messy and fragile. Thus, without further ado. It's 3.02 in the morning. You're awake and at first you don't know why, but then you shift your gaze to the window an unearthly orange glow spills onto your floor. You climb out of bed, tiptoe over to the pane, and peer out the slightly frosted glass to see your neighbor's home is on fire. You throw on the stringy gray bathrobe you've had since college, slip into your Crocs, and venture out into the cold. Though it only takes a minute before the smoke starts to cling to your hair, you can hear the crackling flames leaping from your neighbor's porch. No one is awake but you, it seems. No distant peal of sirens, no throng of neighborhood watchers, just you, the licking flames, and the smoke. So you jump into action. You call 911, you report that fire, then throw caution to the biting wind and run straight towards the front door of your neighbor's home, banging against with both fists, hollering, fire, wake up, there's a fire. When no one answers, you step towards one of the tall windows bracketing the front door, continue banging, press your face to the warm glass, trying to peek through the dark slits between the blinds. Finally, You hear the drum roll of footsteps. The front door opens, and your neighbor is standing there in his pajamas, panic, still in the process of wiping away the residue of sleep. The two of you dive back into the house, grab the kids, the dogs, the old photos, haul ass out of there. By the time the firefighters arrive, you're standing on the sidewalk, your gray robe decidedly grayer, your face grayer still. You press the heel of your hand into your mouth as you begin coughing up a lung, and while hunched over, you notice that Crocs can, in fact, melt when subjected to extreme heat, and you wonder about the state of your feet, which went numb, along with the rest of your body once the sight of a fire truck turned off the spigot of adrenaline. But this isn't my house on fire, you say. And instead of getting checked out by the frenetic-looking EMTs, you trudge back home, slide back into bed, barely sleep a wink, before hitting the alarm to get ready for work. I often feel like I'm that person who wakes up in the middle of the night to run over to my neighbor's house. But if my house catches on fire, I'd somehow fly a massive tarp over my home so that I can douse the flames in total privacy. Like, I'm all for helping other people put out their fires, but I'll be damned if I accept help putting out my own. And sometimes... I feel like we go from day to day, putting one fire out after another, usually belonging to our colleagues, spouses, children, parents, even our communities, without stopping to look down to see if our feet have melted off. Despite what you may see on the internet, I'm actually terrible at vulnerability. Telling a personal story or revealing the ugliest parts of me to millions of strangers, very easy. Allowing myself to be revealed in a moment of fragility to my family or friends? No. That's literally what I hear when I so much as think about calling up a girlfriend to discuss my troubles or bursting into tears in front of my husband. No, you're not allowed to do that. I used to think it was because 
I don't want to be a burden. And there is some truth to this. As my parents age, I don't want them to worry about me. They've spent half their lives worrying about me, and I think they've earned a few worry-free chapters in their books. But because they're parents, the only way I can shield them from the natural parental urge to panic over every paper cut, I keep my hurts to myself. But the truth is, there's more than a healthy dose of ego and pride in my choice to helicopter a tarp over my house on fire. Decades ago, when my very first dog passed away, I kept myself in my room, howling with heartbreak. My father came knocking, and I cracked open the door, thinking he might say something kind, soothing in his own quirky way. Instead, he told me, it's not right to cry so much. Stop showing so much emotion. I slammed the door in his face as hard as I could, as if I could physically eject his words from my body. My father's disapproval might seem cruel, but it was not unusual. I've seen my father cry plenty of times while watching movies like The Little Princess, but he keeps a tight rein on his emotions in every other setting. I've only seen him really lose it a handful of times, the most memorable being when his own mother passed away. Harmony suffered a massive stroke and died quite suddenly in her early 70s. Needless to say, we were all unprepared. That day, Daddy burst into tears at the kitchen table over lunch. He didn't stop until Sol Harmony, my maternal grandmother, padded over to him, pressed one of her hands on his left shoulder, and said kindly but firmly, Stop crying. It's not good to cry so much. It's been 208 days since Rudy died. The intensity of my grief competes daily with the enormity of my shame. I am embarrassed that I can't seem to get over it. I'm embarrassed that losing my Rudy has hurt me far more than losing my other dogs, my grandfather, either of my grandmothers, or any other family member. Inanely, I ask myself, would David Goggins cry this hard over a dog? No, no, he wouldn't, so stop it. I know that I am allowed to grieve in private, and I, rightfully, get angry at friends who think they are entitled to my vulnerability just by virtue of their title as friend. They aren't, but at the same time, I realize that by refusing to lean on anyone when I'm struggling, I'm not only cutting off much-needed aid, I may also be cheating myself of the kind of relationship that grows exclusively from laying ourselves bare. And I'm not just saying this for the touchy-feely reasons, but for the practical, somewhat selfish reasons. Science has proven that positive friendships can lower your blood pressure, reduce inflammation, and decrease your overall risk of diabetes. Conversely, science suggests that toxic friendships can have the opposite effect on your health, increasing your risk for depression, which is not a surprise, obesity, and substance abuse. Studies have also shown that strong friendships lead to longer life and more happiness, while social and emotional isolation can contribute to a weaker immune system. I've played counselor to many people over the course of my life. Starting in junior high, I served as mediator during the hours-long screaming matches between my mom and dad. I protected my little brother from excessive parental criticism, kept the peace inside our home, lest the frame of our Wilmette house light up in the explosion of one of my parents' fights. In all that time, I learned how dangerous it was to need anything because neediness led directly to conflict. So. I couch my vulnerability in excessive intellectualism or humor, pretend that adversity is merely a problem-solving exercise like the ones you see in the LSAT, or, when all else fails, dive into puzzles to patch my grief with the pages of my Sudoku book. Unfortunately, none of these things is a recipe for intimacy. And yes, friendship requires platonic intimacy in order to grow. Ten days after Rudy died, I forced myself to meet with a friend, Cindy, who happened to be in town. Cindy is a superstar lit agent, and you'll probably hear from her in a future podcast episode. And I actually met her at an event I moderated for one of her clients. Like me, she's Korean-American, and like me, she was once a lawyer. 
Maybe because we had so much in common, at least on paper, we became fast friends. We send long voice memos to each other on our phones, sometimes taking months to reply, but still always replying. Thus, when she said she was going to be in SoCal and wanted to get together without taking any inventory of my actual feelings, I concluded, it's been several days. You're over it. And now it's time to be social again. But things didn't go as planned. And that day, I wrote in my diary, I met with Cindy for lunch, and I started crying in the middle of talking to her, a fairly regular occurrence these days. I have turned into a scratch and sniff sticker, only instead of a smell, I emit ugly cry. Cindy and I met for coffee and pastries at one of my favorite spots in Los Angeles. We didn't really talk about Rudy, but sitting there on a sunny day, eating vegan croissants al fresco in the middle of a posh little neighborhood by Beverly Hills as if everything was normal, it caught me off guard. Everything was normal until it wasn't. And before I knew it, my face was crumpling up into my hands. I was horrifically embarrassed, corked my tears with a watery laugh and changed the subject. But there was something inexplicably soothing about being with another Korean woman who perhaps could understand without having to be told the immensity of both my shame and grief. That brief chat with Cindy so shortly after Rudy's death taught me a lot about what it means to be vulnerable and how important that can be. So on this week's Ask Joanne, we tackle a simple and straightforward question by Sarah. How do I not be so scared of emotional vulnerability? One of my favorite aphorisms in all the world is, courage isn't the absence of fear. It is the ability to do what is right in spite of your fear. Indeed, I would go so far as to say that courage can't exist in the absence of fear because bravery is about doing hard things, not easy things. If you have zero fear about going into a lion's den, good for you, but that's not courage. That's just fearlessness or insanity. Thus, I think the first thing we have to do is give yourself permission to feel fear. It's okay to be afraid of walking into a lion's den, and it's okay to be afraid of bearing your heart to someone. While it can be difficult to do something in spite of your fear, what is oftentimes just as challenging, if not more so, is figuring out, well, what is the right thing to do? And by right, I'm not just referring to a moral, ethical dilemma, although that's certainly possible. I'm also talking about what's right for you, or as I often like to think of it, most effective for you. Thus, when we're talking about emotional vulnerability, it's important to recognize that you don't have to, nor should you, make yourself vulnerable to everyone. There are definitely people out there who will take advantage of you, cheat you, and even abuse you. And part of life is learning how to recognize them from far enough away that they can't hurt you. Part of life is also learning how to retrieve your heart from those very same people once you've determined that they are no longer worthy of your affection. And that, Sarah, is the crux of it. You must always remember that your vulnerability is precious because it is the only door that opens to you and you are the only you in the entire universe. It's entirely suitable for you to be selective and careful about who gets the key to that door. However, if you're always turning people away simply out of fear, even when you know that letting them in might do you a world of good, remind yourself that courage is not just doing the hard thing, but knowing yourself well enough to believe that even if you get hurt, you'll be okay. Many of us, we haven't been told by enough people in our lives the following very simple but powerful affirmation. You're going to be okay. And as a result of that, we start believing that we are weaker than we actually are, that bravery is reserved for everyone else. But this is a lie. And perhaps you can defeat the lie by being that person in your life, the one you maybe didn't go to enough of when you were growing up, by telling yourself, you're going to be okay. Because you will. 
And with that, we're on to parting thoughts. I once spent two whole weeks in New York City, mostly by myself. I rented an Airbnb back when it was brand new in Soho, a huge loft style condo with a baby grand piano and a solid oak dining table. I was working out of the firm's New York office and like to believe I was getting a real taste of the big city life. I waltzed past the small bodega on the corner of Worcester on my way home from the office or followed the lights reflecting off the slick black streets that throbbed through Soho or paid $13 for a cluster of yellow roses from the Korean market because they reminded me of my mother. I found it hard to sleep at night not because of the ceaseless chorus of sirens out the window or the thing that was making irregularly scratchy noises in the bedroom closet, but because all the signs of life around me seemed to press in on me as if to say, you are so alone. Years later in Chicago, when I was truly living alone in my own adult apartment, when I couldn't sleep, I'd get out of the bed and curl up next to the window overlooking Lakeshore Drive, and pretend I could see into all the cars lighting up the city so late at night. I'd create stories about them in my head. Simple stories like, he's getting home really late and his wife is going to be mad, but then they'll watch TV together and everything will be okay. Or, they're just getting back from a really boring dinner party and can't wait to order pizza when they get home. Or, she's just finished writing a brief at the office and gets to go home to her two dogs who will be so excited to see her. And then, I'd shift my gaze to the lights dotting the pier, jutting out into the lake, and I'd count them. One, two, three, all the way to eleven, before crawling back into bed, drifting off into dreams suffused with the fellowship of traffic. Eventually, Anthony would come into my home and heart, and I'd no longer have to rely on made-up people sitting in Chicago traffic to keep me company, Maybe there's something altogether pathetic about that chapter in my life. I don't know. But every now and again, when things get a little bit hard, when courage grows a little bit scarce, I remember those yellow roses, the soft lights of Lakeshore Drive cleaving to my bedroom window, and I am reminded all over again, I am never alone.